2nd of September, 1918, the Canadian Corps had taken the Drocourt Quillant line. And at eight o'clock, the infantry of the Corps started to advance to their next objective, which was the Canal du Nord. On the sector of the 4th Division, the troops advancing met a wall of German machine gun and artillery and trench mortar fire. The advancing waves were cut to ribbons and the attack broke down. Now, the Canadian official history based on the surviving senior officer from the Corps had an account that was clear, convincing, and compelling as to what occurred. And in fact, it was so convincing that every subsequent Canadian historian has followed it. And as clear, as concise, as compelling, as convincing as that account was, it's wrong. So the purpose of this presentation is to take a look at what exactly was the plan for 2nd of September, what happened? What did the Canadian official history have to say about it? How it's wrong? And then in the second part, I'm going to tell the sad and depressing story of the Canadian official histories and why they went wrong. So the context of this was the Battle of Second Arras running from the 26th of August to the 3rd of September, 1918. And this was the most important operational assignment the Canadian Corps received in the First World War, more important than Vimy, Passchendaele, or Amiens. But it tends to get buried in the larger narrative of the 100 days. Most of the attention is focused on the Battle of Amiens. But Curry called Arras, a greater victory than Amiens. In fact, he called it the hardest battle the Canadian Corps fought. And it was a very different type of battle from Amiens in that uh, unlike Amiens, there weren't masses of tanks available. There was not an elite corps on the flank. The Germans were not surprised. In fact, the Germans had masses of reserves available. They had a deep set of very powerful fortifications the Canadians would have to fight their way through. The origin of this battle starts with the attack by the 4th Army on the 8th of August, the Black Day of the German Army, according to Eric Ludendorff. So the Canadians, along with the Australians, British, and the French, smashed the German forward positions and advanced a great distance. But eventually the attack started to bog down. Canadians moved back to the Arras sector, and the focus of the offensive shifted to the 3rd Army. So on the 21st of August, Julian Bing's 3rd Army started its attack. What he, the commander of the British Expeditionary Force wanted was for it to advance to the northeast to crack the Drocourt Quillant line. That's that red line you see in the middle of your screen. And what that would do is it's the linchpin of the German defensive system, both north and south. You knock that out, the Germans are going to have to fall back. Now, what happens is the Third Army does not advance as fast as Haig wants. So he shifts the focus of the attack to the Canadians, there to advance along the Arras Cambrai Road and strike southeast for 27 kilometers and take high ground outside of Cambrai. To do this, they're going to have to advance through a zone of uh, fortifications, five separate defensive lines, 15 kilometers deep, some of the best defenses on the Western Front, and then cross the Canal du Nord, break the Marquain line, and seize those heights. So it is a great challenge the Canadians have. The attack opens on the 26th of August, and by the 1st of September, the Canadians have ground forward 12 of the 27 kilometers. They have reached a jump-off line suitable for attacking the final defensive German line, the Drocourt Quillant line. So on the 2nd of September, what the plan is, is that the Canadians centered on the Arras Cambrai Road are going to advance in four phases. There's a red line about 2,500 yards from the start, a green line overlooking the Canal du Nord, blue line on the other side, and a brown line you see at the uh, lower right part of the screen, which will be the final objective. So 15 kilometers advance in one day. It is a tough nut. So what did the official history have to say about this? And just as a side note, the picture that you see is of the mill that was fought over on the 2nd of September. I'll show you where it's located later, but it changed hands about six times in the course of the battle. 
So the official history's account is based on Andrew McNaughton's interview with the official historian. McNaughton in 1918 was the Canadian Corps uh, counter-battery staff officer. So he is at the center of events. And the story that he tells is that the attack on the 4th Division front failed because artillery support was suspended. So a field artillery barrage was suspended to allow Raymond Brutonell's Canadian Independent Force. This is a conglomeration of truckborne and mounted forces uh, that were uh, supposed to seize crossings over the Canal de Nord at the town of Marcoin. We'll spend a lot more time talking about this. Also, Erroneous reports of armored cars at the canal meant that the German artillery in that zone was not suppressed. So the combination of the suspended field artillery barrage and unsuppressed German artillery fire was what caused such heavy casualties to the 4th Division. Now, the Canadian Independent Force, which I just mentioned, has caused for two different perspectives from Canadian historians resulting from this. The first is, is that Brutonel had the ear of Curry and he had hoodwinked Curry into overestimating what this force could do. So Curry gave it an assignment that it could not succeed. So the suspension of the field artillery barrage was a double mistake. The other perspective is that this was a proto-armored force, a combined arms group that really looked forward to the Second World War and only mischance prevented it from achieving great results. This has become then the standard explanation almost every historian has followed as to what occurred. In a sense, the official history laid the tracks and we've all just followed along. So now I wanna go and take a look at what was the plan because this is an important part of being able to refute what the official history had to say and then what actually happened on the 2nd of September. So let's start with resources. So Curry had three divisions. He had seven tank companies with 54 tanks. He had 20 field artillery brigades with uh, 480 pieces, 192 heavy pieces and 11 brigades, 13 RAF squadrons and the CIF. So, and here's a picture of uh, some of the elements of the CIF waiting to advance on the 2nd of September. As you can see, it's a truck borne force, and this will be important later. So the three divisions Curry had available were the first Canadian uh, on the left. It had been fighting for three days. It had four fresh battalions and a density of 1.3 men per meter. Now GHQ's doctrine called for a density of an attack of three to five men per meter, where five men are necessary for an attack as strong as the DQ line. The 4th Canadian, the focus of this presentation, had only been in uh, fighting for a single day. It had nine fresh battalions and a density of 2.24. The 4th British was in pretty poor shape. It had been fighting for three days. Two of its battalions were ineffective. So it only had seven available, three of which were fresh, a density of little over one man per meter. All of which is to say, is Curry is asking, gonna to have to ask a lot from his divisions to carry this out. There were five key considerations that went into the plan. The first is that the prime objective is the drocourt quiant line, and it is a formidable defensive position built on the same precepts as the Hindenburg line. It is protected by thick belts or barbed wire like you see in this photo. Further, uh, German infantry can shelter in concrete emplacements called mibus that are impervious to anything lighter than an eight inch shell. Further, there are uh, reportedly tunnels linking the various German lines. All of which to say is that breaking the DQ line is going to be a great, great challenge. Further, the Canadian intelligence that identified through captured documents and officer interrogations that the Germans intended to defend this position to the last. It was their winter line. There is no falling back. The Canadian intelligence had also accurately identified that the defenders in the 4th Canadian Division sector, which they would attack, were relatively, in fact, 
very weak. There was the 4th Ursas Division. It had been fighting for three days, not a great division to begin with. It had suffered heavily. Backstopping it was the 2nd Guards Reserve Division. Now, if you hear guards, you would think, well, that's got to be an elite formation. In fact, it was far from it. It had suffered very heavily in an attack on it by the Third Army just a, a week earlier. It had lost something like 6,000 prisoners. It was not a good division to begin with, and it had been badly battered. One of its regiments, although the Canadians did not know this, consisted of two companies, and the regimental commander indicated somewhat indirectly to his high command that they would fold up like a wet paper bag if attacked. So Canadian intelligence also knew that the Germans were rushing reserves to the sector. So the expectation was they would not defend a position as important as the DQ line uh, with these two weak, weak formations. They would in fact reinforce it with reserves. All of which meant, leading to the fourth point, is if the Canadians can break the DQ line. Now, yes, this is an important if, but if they can break the DQ line, there are no organized defenses till you reach the Marcoin line across the Canal du Nord. It is green fields beyond. If you can break it, you can roll over any surviving Germans or any reserves moving up, just like they did at Amiens, and you will have a smooth, clear advance to the canal. And the final point is, what do you do when the barrage ends? This is a key decision. The green circles that you see on your screen are some of the locations of the field artillery. I wasn't able to get all of them. But uh, they could, the artillery could reach as far as the red line. So when that ends, what happens? Now, one point I want you to emphasize is uh, these three um, field artillery brigades are actually located on the wrong side of two rivers. And the rivers in these areas are actually just muddy little trickles, but they have deep banks. So it means any horse-drawn transport, like guns, have to cross at bridges. The Germans know where these are, and they are being shelled. So what does Curry do? What's his, uh, he's got three options. And the first option is when the barrage ends, he does what the Germans do, is you do not pause, you do not wait for, for lines drawn on a map, you keep pushing, you drive your forces forward, you find soft spots, and you ruthlessly exploit them. But this is not British doctrine. The Canadians have not trained on this. This is not a viable option. Option two is you pause long enough to bring up the field artillery and fire another barrage. That entails moving 1,400 limbers, guns, and wagons across, in some cases, two rivers through congested terrain, set them, uh, and get them set up and get ready to fire. This is going to take four and realistically six hours. In those six hours, there are three negative consequences of this. The first is that ground that you could have taken for pennies is going to cost pounds because you're going to have to fight over it. The Germans will have moved up reserves. Secondly, it means it gives the Germans even more time to prepare the crossing points across the Canal du Nord for destruction. And we will talk more about why that's important. And the third and most important reason is that Canadian infantry, even at the most aggressive rates of advance, are not going to reach the Canal du Nord until around six o'clock. That does not give them enough time to cross the river, fight another battle, and get to the final objective. If you adopt this approach, you're implicitly admitting that it's going to take at least two days to reach the heights. And so Curry is going to look and choose this, the third option, where you pause just long enough to bring up reserves, you leapfrog, and then you continue the advance. You don't have a field artillery barrage, although you will have field artillery batteries assigned to infantry brigades that are capable of firing uh, direct fire missions, but not area fire. So what is then is the final plan. So I'm going to just focus on the 4th Division, such as the subject of this presentation. So the 4th Division will start at 5 o'clock and attack with two brigades supported by 38 tanks. So they'll be the 10th and 12th Brigades. And remember I mentioned about Mount Dury? Well, this is the location, and there you can see as kind of a dot is where the mill is located. At 8 o'clock, 
the 11th Brigade, along with support battalions from the 10th and 12th, will then advance to the Green Line. Uh, the uh, 4th Division had so many different tasks, they had to commit every single battalion in the division to a task during this battle. In some cases, some battalions had as many as two separate missions during the day. So you can see how far the Canadians were stretched. Now, at the same time, at 8 o'clock, the Canadian Independent Force, that force of trucks and armored cars and cavalry and so forth, which we'll talk about, is going to race down the Arras Cambrai Road, high diddle diddle right up the middle in terms of American football, and capture a bridgehead at Marcoin, which will be a very important mission. So let's talk. Uh, okay, yeah, sorry. Protecting the CIF, allowing it to advance, is a no fire zone of 500 meters on each side of the road. So the heavy artillery is not allowed to fire in this zone unless they can directly spot the location. All of which means is that the Germans in that area are not going to be fired upon. So what about the CIF? Here's another picture of uh, the troops waiting to advance. As you can see, uh, this element is uh, truck board. So it consists of a, uh, two motor machine gun brigades mounted in trucks with a total of 80 machine guns. There's one and a half cavalry regiments that are mounted. There is one artillery battery that is um, uh, horse drawn. You have a cyclist battalion on bicycles, an armored car detachment, and a Newton mortar section, a six inch mortars mounted in trucks. So as you can see, it's a very much a mixed mobility force. It's a hastily assembled. You only meet the night before the battle. There is no standard doctrine. They have not had a chance to train together. But they have two very important missions. The first is, is that this sector of the Canal du Nord that I've just highlighted in blue is um, partially flooded. It would be very, very difficult to do an assault crossing in this sector. So it is absolutely imperative that some bridges get captured. And that's the purpose of the CIF. They seize a bridgehead at Marcoin, and with the 80 machine guns in that forest, they'll be easily able to defend the bridgehead until Canadian uh, infantry can arrive and uh, relieve them. But there's an, an uh, implicit reason as well as to why, and that's why that it's important. And that in a sense is prevent Douglas Haig from uh, foisting his cavalry corps on the Canadians. And why is that a problem? Well, let me explain. So the red line that you see on the screen is the Arras Cambrai Road. It is the only all weather road in this sector. All the other roads are uh, badly damaged from the fighting over the last year and a half. They are subject to lots of wear and tear. So it's absolutely imperative that this road be ma maintained uh, in an open status because that's the main route for supplies, movement of reserves, as well as repositioning of artillery. And this is the start line with the fourth uh, British 4th Canadian and the 1st Canadian Division. The problem is, is that why Curry does not want the Cavalry Corps is because it is going to jam up his main supply route. This is the road space that a cavalry division, just the fighting portion, will take up. And the cavalry can only reach the front along this part of the sector. There is no open ground. This whole sector is seen with trenches and uh, barbed wire and the detritus of battle. So they have to travel on the road. In doing so, they're going to clog it up entirely. That's just one cavalry division, and that's just just the fighting portion, you would have to add another four kilometers for the first line transport. So you've got the first cavalry, a motor, motorized infantry brigade and two machine gun battalions, all having to transit the road. All of which means the road will be put out of action for the full day if it was committed. So what Curry and Horn, the commander of the first army do, is they convince Haig that with the CIF, they've got an immediate exploitation force that can seize the bridgeheads. And that, that then leaves the cavalry to do more strategic or operational exploitation. And the cavalry can remain on the far side of Arras and not clog up the Canadian supply routes as a result. 
So in summary, the CIF is actually given a really important assignment for two of these two factors. So what happens on the 2nd of September? Well, it turns out the DQ line falls relatively easily. Uh, there's a distinct difference in the casualty figures that you see for the battalions that were tasked with taking the DQ line and the ones that advanced after eight o'clock, almost a two to one difference all, uh, often. A combination of Canadian infantry skill, tanks, uh, a very strong barrage as well as smoke and the weak German defenders uh, allowed the DQ line to fall with relative ease. There were still significant casualties, but the German infantry did not fight well. The machine gunners died hard as always. But it turns out the Germans defended in depth. And so it was this defense in depth that, all, that involved the uh, leading waves getting obliterated by the uh, German fire. Further, the CIF was unenterprising. And I'm being really polite here. The reality was the uh, CIF suffered about 10% casualties where infantry battalions on each flank were suffering on the order of 50 to 60% casualties. Uh, the lead unit was the 10th Hussar Regiment, British Cavalry Regiment, and it suffered three men wounded and managed to even bollocks up the uh, uh, reconnaissance that it did not notice that the Germans had cut trees across the Arras Cambrai Road. So when the armored cars tried to advance down it, they had to turn around because there were trees across and somehow the cavalry had missed it. And the report of the 78th Battalion, this is on the Northern flank of the CIF, I think captured what happened uh, to the best. Resistance was met where it was apparently least anticipated and less where it had been anticipated. Essentially, the Germans had not fought the way Canadians had thought they would. Now, just to show you what I mean by the defense in depth. So here is the 4th Ursats and 2nd Guards Reserve Division deployed within the DQ line system. Backstopping it, is the 1st Guards Reserve Division, a very much different formation from the 2nd Guards. It, in fact, is an elite formation. It is almost at full strength, and it has been heavily reinforced with machine gun detachments. As a result, it has a tremendous amount of firepower. And based on Canadian reports, you can see where some of these were deployed. The result was that when the 11th Brigade attacked, um, it, it it could not engage the German machine gun fire from, uh, from in, in, deployed in depth. They just did not have the range or firepower, and they didn't have the resources available to make much of a difference. The result of which is that the 4th Division suffered more fatal casualties during second arrest than the other three divisions did, even though it was in line for half as long as the others. So what do we say about the official history? The author is Nicholson, so hence the Nicholson refutation. Well, first of all, there was no barrage to suspend. At no point in the planning was there ever to be a field artillery barrage. Even on the first draft, 27th of August, written in pencil, the bare outlines of the plan was already set and there was no intent to wait for a barrage to fire. Further, I could find no records of armored cars at the canal in any of the Canadian records. Now, it is possible that that information has gotten lost in the 103 years, but given the absolute lack of success of the CIF, I think it highly unlikely that, in fact, there were any reports. The no fire zone had no influence on the attack of the 4th Division. At its closest point, it's 1,200 meters from the red line, 1,700 from Mount Dury, far beyond the range of accurate machine gun fire. It's only a harassment at that range. But further, the division boundaries for the Germans had the no fire zone in this sector of the uh, German division fighting the first Canadian division. The first Canadian was much closer. So any Germans firing from there are gonna be focused on what the first division was doing. Reported German artillery battery positions, only 6% were fired from within the zone. And I define that very, very liberally. 
What that meant is 94% of the firing positions that were reported were coming from outside the zone. Majority were positioned across the river uh, to the north or across the Canal du Nord. Uh, but the most telling point, and what I think is the most the, the most significant reason why Nicholson got this wrong is that when you look at the battalion, brigade, and division reports, there is no mention of an artillery barrage suspension the, or, or fire from the no-fire zone. It was all about the Germans in front of them putting up that staunch resistance. The 1st Guards Reserve Division uh, fought hard and fought well. It was, in fact, the only division that started on the front on the 2nd of September that was still combat effective at the end of the day. Every other German formation was uh, blown to bits. All right, so how did the official history get it wrong? Now, the official history, the one that I'm going to be talking about, that where it got it wrong, is published in 1962, and it has a very strong um, reputation. When I did my uh, book on the Canadians on the Somme, uh, I could not find any errors in Nicholson's account. I may have not agreed with all of his um, analysis, uh, but there were no outright errors. Whereas in the Arras section, there's not only just this, but there are important dates that it conflates. There are things that are smudged and things that are fudged. Uh, it is just a dog's breakfast in comparison to the quality of the earlier work. So let's take a look at this. And I'm gonna do this by starting with looking at the official histories. And I think for most of us, or many of you, you may not be aware that in fact, there were three official histories. So the first one, is uh, the report of the Ministry Overseas Military Forces of Canada. Is this not a, just a striking title? It's published in 1919, and the major part of the book is an account of the operations of the Canadian Corps in 1918. And it was written by a group formed by Curry to ensure the story was told the way he wanted it to be, to be told. It was in reaction to a book published in 1916 by Max Aitken, later Lord Beaverbrook. He, he had done a book called Canada in Flanders on Canadian operations at Second Arras in 1915, sorry, Second Eve in 1915. And uh, Curry thought he had been viciously slandered by Aiken. Further, he believed Aiken was part of a cabal that was working to undermine and unseat him. So he regarded Aiken as a, uh, a great enemy. And so he did not want to leave his reputation in Aiken's hands. He was going to ensure history was done right by getting it written himself. So taking a look at the documents that were gathered, it was a group of staff officers that gathered information and then wrote the report. The information itself is extremely extremely useful. In fact, I have a book coming out in the fall about Second Arras, and a lot of that information ended up in the book. However, when you take a look at the various drafts of this book, the first draft is good. The second draft has got some mistakes entering in, and the third draft, the one that gets published, is actually seriously flawed in some important respects. Curry, or the guy who was in charge of this project, had done some editing in the process. And the person in charge was Brigadier General Raymond Brutnell. He's an interesting character. Brutnell is a uh, born in France, served in the French army as a conscript. He has no more military experience. He immigrates to Canada in 1905. Uh, he moves to Alberta, uh, initially acts as a journalist, and then starts branching out into other entrepreneurial activities, uh, becomes quite wealthy and influential. And he raises a motor machine gun brigade at the start of the war. He takes it over to France. He gets Bing's, the commander of the Canadian Corps, ear, later Curry's ear, and um, becomes eventually the commander of the Canadian Machine Gun Corps. He's a very innovative officer. He uh, is at least credited with being one of the inventors of the indirect machine gun barrage. And he's a great advocate of the machine gun arm. And why I'm spending so much time on him is he will be important in a few moments. So the second part of this is the official history of the Canadian forces and the Great War 1914 to 1919. Project starts in 1921. 
and the first volume of the proposed eight that takes the story to September 1915 is published in 1938. Yes, it took 17 years. Whereas the British and the Australians have churned out volume after volume after volume, they've only got to September 1915 by almost at the start of the Second World War. The project, not surprisingly, is killed in 1946, and the resources moved to the Canadian official history of the Second World War, a far more successful project. The author of this is Colonel Archer Fortescue Duguid, a Scottish-born staff officer that served in the Canadian Corps. Notice that's the second non-native Canadian who's been working on this. He is not a professional historian, and as one wag suggested, he was far more interested in heraldry than in history. He is slow, he is methodical, and he is unfocused. He wants to avoid controversy, so he is determined to gather every bit of information he can, cross every uh, T and dot every I, and then just go back and do it again just to be super careful. The result is, is that it's almost nothing gets done. And with the project killed in 1946, there is really no official history of the entire Canadian war effort. So in 1956, the Canadian government recognizes with the 50th anniversary fast looming, it's necessary to publish something. So the idea is that there will be a one volume history that covers the entire war. It'll be ready in 1959. It doesn't actually get published to 62, but it is well received. But nevertheless, it is a single volume history. Its author is Colonel G.W.L. Nicholson. He's a British born officer. Again, notice the trend. Uh, but he is the author of multiple respected histories. He did very good books on uh, the fighting Newfoundlanders, uh, the Canadian artillery, and the Canadians in Italy as an official history. His challenge is that when he's writing, almost all of the authorities that he could go to have died. There's not many left. By 1961, there are only two Brigadier Generals left alive, one of whom did not take part in the battle at the, the, the stage of 2nd of September. He also relied quite heavily on Duguid's history for the first part and in the Brutonelle histories. And you can tell this because the same mistakes that are in the Brutonelle history are repeated in the uh, official history. So I want to introduce the final character here, General Andrew McNaught. So he's the guy that gave the information. He is a militia officer prior to the war. He is, rises to command or to be the counter battery staff officer in 1917, 1918, a very innovative and scientifically oriented officer. He is one of the key figures that makes Canadian counter battery one of the best in the BEF. He remains in the army and rises to be the chief of the general staff from 1929 to 1935. He's later the head of the National Research Council. And during the Second World War, he successively commands the First Canadian Division, uh, the Canadian Corps, and then the First Canadian Army from 42 to 43. And he's also the Minister of National Defense from 44 to 45. All of which to say, this guy is got a lot of heft, a lot of weight. There's no one bigger in the Canadian military or military history than McNaught in 1961. So how did things get so wrong? Well, McNaughton has a beef. In fact, he has two beefs with Brutonelle, both a professional and a uh, personal beef. So the personal beef stems from claims that Brutonelle had made that outraged McNaughton. So uh, at Amiens, uh, Curry had persuaded Rawlinson along, and then Rawlinson then persuaded Haig to stop an attack scheduled for the 15th of August based on evidence of the strength of German defenses. Now, Brutnell claimed it was his evidence that changed Curry's mind, whereas McNaughton believed it was his evidence that did so. Also, Brutonel claimed that the extraordinarily high German casualty in relation to Canadian ones that the final Canadian battle at Valsien at the start of November 1918 was the result of his indirect machine gun barrages. McNaughton was so angry at this, he actually sent staff officers out to survey German dead in the field to be able to determine what killed them. And it was the uh, artillery fire rather than machine gun fire that did the slaughtering. 
Further, McNaughton had no confidence or belief in the utility of indirect fire. He believed it was almost an entirely, entire waste of ammunition and effort. So McNaughton meets with Nicholson in 1961. And McNaughton, this is based on the transcripts of the interview, uh, has it that he is working without notes. He has not reviewed his, his, uh, his diary. He has not reviewed any documents or any maps. He's going off memory of events that occurred 43 years before. And this is a man who has led a very eventful life. So the issue is that McNaughton spins this story of suspended barrages and armor cars and all of this, and Nicholson accepts it without questioning. Why? Well, there's a couple of factors. One is McNaughton has tremendous heft and prestige. Somebody who is central to the story, who was at the very middle of the whole thing, who should know what had gone on, is giving him this great, clean story. Further, there is no one left alive that can really gainsay him. So if you were writing this in the 1930s, there would be no shortage of generals that would say, well, that's just simply not the case. But they're all dead by this point. Further, Nicholson's running out of time and space. So remember, the book was supposed to be published in 59. Well, it's now 1961, and the book is published in 62. And so he's taking shortcuts. And hence, he relies on Brutinelle. He does not go back to the original documents. And one of the key signifiers of this is that the Battle of Hill 70, which took place in August of 1917, has twice as many pages as Second Arras. So Second Arras, most important operational assignment, Hill 70, is a diversionary attack during Third Passchendaele. It gets 11 pages of coverage in the British official history out of 384 pages. And while it's the first, Hill 70 was the first battle that Curry commanded as a Canadian uh, Corps commander, it's still, it, two and a part divisions take part. It's a much smaller, far less important battle in, in comparison to Ross, but it gets twice the coverage. So I think the, the, Reason for all of this is that Nicholson is backed into a corner. He gets a great story, drops in his lap. He doesn't have anyone that he can quickly check with, and he's just got to get this thing produced. So in conclusion, what can we say about all of this? Well, I think and I hope that I have demonstrated that Nicholson's account is faulty on multiple dimensions. Secondly, I think we should also recognize the importance of track setting, how official histories or their first uh, authoritative account will tend to set everything in a direction that subsequent historians will follow, especially if the early part of it is really quite well done. Later parts are not going to be as checked as closely. It also, I think, is something that should be flagged for us as writers and as readers to be aware of the seductive tyranny of authority and novelty. So authority is that when you have a character who is in the uh, center of the story, who should know what's going on as a historian, that's what you dream of having a source like this. And while you should trust it, you should also verify it. You absolutely need to ensure that there is not a hidden agenda going on. In this case, I don't think it's so much that Nicholson was deliberately lying. I think he just didn't remember very well. And it's necessary then, as a, especially as a reader, is okay, who have you tested this approach or this story with? And as to novelty, sometimes there is a new technology, a new weapon system that gets all of this attention and we overestimate how effective it actually is. So in the case of the CIF, it was um, more or less entirely unsuited to the action that it was tasked with. Uh, it's this mixed mobili mobility force. It is basically um, forced to rely on roads. It cannot travel off road. So as soon as the road is uh, uh, blocked, they're not moving. It had, while it had tremendous mobility in a sense that administratively, you could move behind the lines very quickly. And it had tremendous defensive firepower with the 80 machine guns. Offensively, it was essentially reduced to having 
a cyclist battalion, which had 335 men in it. So it had very little in the way of offensive capability or ability to maneuver uh, on open terrain. And hence, we need to be aware what novelty sometimes can blind us or cloud or, uh, our judgment on how effective is it really? And finally, this is why we still do history, why we still read, we still try to understand because there are new perspectives, there's new information, there are new ways of examining it and to test what has happened and what has been discussed before. And that's why I hope that we all st still continue to do history as the years go on. Thank you, I'll hand it back to you, David. Thanks very much indeed, Bill. That was absolutely tremendous, uh, really fast paced and interesting presentation, which I'm sure everybody's enjoyed. So ladies and gentlemen, in the time of tradition, you all know what happens now. If you if you enjoyed that, can we give a, a, a virtual round of applause to Bill via the raise hand button that you'll see on the Zoom software underneath. So thanks for that. It's Q&A time. So the first one I'm, I'm going to just ask on, on behalf of one of the um, individuals who watch this is from Barb Walls. Barb has said, kindly send a link or details of the new release on Second Arrows, in other words, your book. Um, and and uh, fantastic talk, thank you, is added to that comment. Bill, over to you. Yes, uh, well, thank you for the, uh, for the interest. Yes, the book's coming out from Hellion. Um, we still have working on a title that'll come out in, um, I believe in the fall is where, when it's scheduled now. Okay, so not not it's not available. Yeah, I don't have a link for it, but as, as soon as I do, we'll, uh, I'll be happy. If anyone is interested, uh, just flag me and I'll be happy to, to send you that information. Sure, if, if anybody's uh, wanted to uh, contact Bill, just send me an email. Okay, Rob, we can hear you. Yeah, fire away with your question. Okay, Bill, I read your book on the Psalm and I really loved it because it was from a- Oh, thank you. Very statistical point or analytic point, which, man, we lost a lot of people. <clears throat> yeah anyways yeah now their story <clears throat> so anyways i enjoyed your your talk today but uh, i don't hear too many people talking about live saves 100 days and that briefly and catch and captures that whole 100 day campaign like it it seems pretty um uh detailed on some accounts and i'm not going to get the book open and look at this part of it but um i just want to know why people don't really talk about live says it's uh if you want the book they're very hard to come by you can get it online yeah. look at it it's got some great maps in it um that that's my question really um yeah and and, and live say has actually quite a good um relationship with Curry. So he got a lot of, I think, inside information along the way. I think it carries a bit of a taint that it's a journalist. It's a hastily thrown together campaign account. You know, it's one of those books that comes out shortly afterwards and you really question as to, uh, you know, it was a focus on speed or on accuracy. And as a result, I think it just kind of gets uh, buried. It doesn't have the official imprimatur, um, but even like the OMFC report is not well known. I'm sure most of the audience have never even heard of this particular uh, work. So I think that whole, in, in, I think in Can Canada's case, there was certainly um, a, a good deal of interest initially, but it quickly faded and it was just something we moved on and we moved away from. And so books like Livesey's kind of gets lost in the, uh, in the in the shuffle. The fact that, uh, you know, the, the first volume of the official history waits to 1938, I think is indicative of a lack of interest in the broader Canadian uh, society and uh, what happened in the First World War. We won, and I don't think, you know, that, that there is not that uh, existential angst that you see in, in British accounts about whether they should have fought at uh, you know, at, at Third Eep or in the Somme and all of this. In the Canadian case, we're ordered there by the British. So, uh, you know, we can't blame our leaders for doing this. And, uh, you know, we did pretty good in the war. So, you know, story done. We did the job. We move on. Hmm. Oh, okay. I, uh, I get you. Uh, I got Nicholson's. I've read that too. And it's like a brief on the whole war. And it's like, wow. <laughs> there's more well, it's pretty amazing he, 
it's pretty amazing how much he covered in one volume. Yeah, it's got some good maps in that one though too. Nicholson's I yep. must admit for uh, I see a lot of them in your uh, presentations as well. So a lot of people use them. So yeah. Yep. Well, there's not much else to to comment on. So. <laughs> okay. Well, looking forward to your next book then. Um, Great. Yep. Thank you. Okay, take care. Th thanks for that, Rob. Thanks very much. Um, I I'm having difficulty uh, getting Anthony Pontifex onto the. Uh, webinar so apologies um, Anthony I'm going to ask your question for you um, and, and Anthony says this um, how did you discover that the official history was so badly wrong originally when previous historians have accepted the official history version as standard in other words how, how did you uh, come across this this uh, shenanigans as we say well I think it I mean one of the challenges is that as you know as a historian you don't have time to look at every dimension, every aspect. And when you have a book that is as well-respected as Nicholson, most historians will just follow along. And if that's not the focus of their topic, they're not going to pay much attention. What flagged it to me was when I was starting the research, um, I noticed that there were two really critical uh, dates for the attack uh, during the whole second Arras campaign. So just to backtrack a little bit, uh, on the 22nd of August, Curry got orders from Haig that it was to support the attack of Douglas Haig's um, operation. And it wasn't until the 24th that they got the order, oh, now you are now the spearhead. The Third Army will support you. So there were two different offensive operations. And Nicholson glues them together and basically wipes out the first one. Um, so that immediately said, well, geez, if that's wrong, where else are there mistakes? And when I started looking at the uh, Fourth Army, I, I started by looking at the, you know, the get down to the coalface, look at the, the war diaries. And I'm not seeing any kind of discussion about an artillery barrage because you see it in the Nicholson. All right. So that should show up that there was a planned artillery barrage that should sh show up in the, the records of the uh, uh, GOCRA, the head of the artillery, or at least 4th fourth fourth Division artillery. There's no mention of it at any point, at which point I go back to the basics and take a look, what is the planning process? And that's where it all starts to come together. So a lot of it is really, you know, you have to go back to the coal face. You have to take a look at what was actually going on and not necessarily accept um, you know, what someone else has, has written. Great, that's fine. Thanks for that answer, Bill. Um, Bradley, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself there. Thanks, Bradley, off you go. Yeah. Hi, Bill, uh, Brad Shewatam uh, from Fredericton. Um, Bill, I'm uh, looking at logistics in the First World War in the Canadian Corps, and I spent the weekend um, working on the uh, motor transport um, companies of the four divisions, and I discovered that the 4th Canadian Divisional MT Company is actually hauling ammo for the 2nd Division on the 27th and 28th of August. And then it says it goes back and it's hauling to divisional ARPs. I'm assuming it's own, but it's got 25 trucks. And not only is the fourth division hauling a lot of ammo, so is the third and the first throughout this time period. And they typically wouldn't haul the ammo if they weren't going to fire it. My next job is to actually take a look at expenditure rates. Uh, my focus, of course, is not what yours is, which is primarily uh, what goes on once you cross the line of departure. I'm, I'm a rear area, rear area guy, but I, I just thought I'd point that out to you. Yeah, so uh, actually great that you're working on that because that is a topic that is sorely under uh, covered and discussed. In fact, the uh, Canadian Corps operations were badly interrupted. They had to stop essentially for a day because the supply system was breaking down because the road system was so bad. As to the truck companies, it was a, um, I would suggest you take a look at the first division report of MENs. The uh, administrative officer had a hate on for the fact that he didn't actually control his truck company. 
that you know it was under actually core control and so he could not get stuff delivered when he wanted to and he was very unhappy about that there had been a, a major change where the the truck companies were put under a senior mto officer anyways yes yeah, so there was uh, that stuff was grouped and then you know, supplies were, were brought forward. The other dimension to look at is the importance of the uh, light rail, because it was its supply, like the first division's ammunition was essentially supplied by light rail. Without it, the Canadian Corps would have had a much slower advance. Yes, yes, I understand. Uh, I've read Sutherland Brown's uh, acerbic report of the SMTO after Amy. Yeah, and yeah. So he, you know all about that. He was not a fan. He didn't want to lose control. <laughs> but I've also taken a look at the utilization rates, and they're dramatically, the trucks are being dramatically underutilized, except for the days of battle. So the yeah. Corps uh, was trying to regain some new control over the allocation of trucks and not have them sit idle. Yeah. Thanks for that. Thanks. Um, John Casey. John, do you know unmute yourself? Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Fascinating talk. Um, my question is about Nicholson's methodology. Did he rely entirely on interviews and correspondence with people who were still around and the earlier histories? Or did he do any work in the archives um, to find the kind of things that you found there? So um, I think he, I think the issue was that he was under pretty severe time constraints. So he did use Do Good because Do Good had done um, a lot of the trawling through the material. So it wasn't really necessary for him to go back into that for that part. And uh, Do Good had gathered information all the way to the Somme, but he Nicholson definitely did go into the archives. He did have access to it. But I think by the time he gets to 1918, he's running out of time. And so you get this bluebird pop into your uh, pocket, uh, into your lap about uh, McNaughton with a nice clean story. It becomes much easier to explain what's going on. I think it was a matter of the combination of uh, McNaughton's prestige and just running out of time to be able to do it. Because the earlier parts of the volume, uh, there are definitely a lot of research that's been done and uh, looking through this. I mean, you do have to take some time to get your, you know, an understanding of what's going on to recognize the problems that, that exist. It's not something that you can just sift through very superficially. You have to, you know, Get the positions on the map and take a look at where is this unit supposed to go and at what time and what's the relationship to the germans etc and that takes time and nicholson i don't think had the time thanks very much thanks for that john thanks um patrick patrick dennis hello there patrick um if you'd care to unmute yourself hello david hello bill hi we can hear you Good, good, to, good to see you, Patrick. Um, fire away. Yeah, uh, the question, uh, Bill, as you're aware, I, I, I've written about the DQ line, and um, I was wondering if you could care, would care to comment a little bit more uh, on uh, one of the diary entries that General Watson made on the 29th of August when he expressed a, a lack of confidence in, the, in the, the program and the plan. He basically said he didn't think it could be carried out. And, and uh, obviously, he, there was a lot of truth in what, what he had written in his own diary. That was on the 29th. Uh, subsequently, as, as you explained in your presentation, the 4th uh, Division was severely mauled, especially uh, two of his brigades, Hayter and, and Odlums. I wonder if you might comment a little bit more on Watson's uh, lack of confidence as opposed to uh, Batty Mac, General McDonnell's overconfidence. Well, certainly, uh, yeah, I think Watson, uh, you know, he was absolutely right. The, the, we're really counting on the Germans, like all the ducks lined up perfectly and everything falls perfectly for the plan to work. And uh, Watson, I don't think had the confidence, uh, say as a batty Mac, to be able to push back really rigorously against Curry. Curry did, however, protest uh, to uh, Haig's chief of staff saying, listen, I need, I, I don't have enough resources. Like in every respect, only in tanks did the Canadians have GHQ uh, mandated or doctrinal uh, concentrations of forces. 
So not only is you're asking a 15 kilometer advance, you're asking troops to do a battle, to uh, do something pretty amazing without sufficient resources where two of the divisions have already been fighting hard for three days. So all in all, it's a big roll of the dice. And uh, Curry did ask the chief of staff, can you take over some of my fronts so I can get a you know more concentration of resources? And Haig said, sorry, that's not going to happen. You have to go on and attack on the front that I've given you. Um, as to Batty Mac, I mean, the division had performed extremely well leading up to the uh, getting to the, the jump off line to attack the DQ line. So he had a fair degree of confidence that they would be successful. But when you really start looking at the plans, there were some very unrealistic expectations of units. Like one unit was expected to achieve its goal in two hours. It took 15 hours in order to pull it off. It was a brilliant, brilliant performance, but it was asking far, far too much of troops to be able to do the things that they were being asked to do. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks for your question there. Um, we've got some questions that I had from some questions from people who, who can't get onto the um, Q&A session. So let me just see if I can, um, yeah, Andrew Boyd is uh, one of them. Um, so Andrew asks, Bill identified the non-Canadian influences on the Canadian histories. Why is it important that Canadians write Canadian histories? Is his <laughs> quite uh, pertinent. Well, I about. mean, as you know, as a Canadian, it's a sore spot when people write you know, someone from outside writes your history is you, you wonder, do they have the, the right perspective? It's, I mean, it's one thing when you have, you know, a body of work, then having someone else's perspective is really valuable. But to start from this from scratch, um, you kind of wonder, you know, what kind of influences are, are involved in it. And I can only comment that the Canadian his, official histories of the Second World War are far better documents than those produced for the First World War. And it was all uh, or at least headed by a Canadian historian, an actual historian, as opposed to a staff officer that's been tasked with writing a history. Thanks for that. Uh, David Pitcher. David, do you just want to unmute yourself there? Hello, Bill. Can you hear Hello. me all right over there? Yes, yes. Yep. I'm a long way away from you in England, so I don't know if my <laughs> voice can reach. Um, another brilliant talk, Bill. Um, my yeah. grandfather's brother was in the 50th on the DQ line, and in the official war diary for the 50th, it says zero hour at 5 a.m., and promptly on the second, every gun for miles on either side opened fire and furnished the heaviest and most effective barrage ever experienced by our troops. Now, was that the problem they could only get as far as the DQ line? And would it have made a difference if that sort of barrage could have been extended further inland, past the line? That's a great question, because there's just so many different angles to that. Um, so, yes, the barrage that was uh, provided for the attack on the DQ Q line was very effective. The combination of uh, a really sophisticated barrage uh, smoke and a great deal of density made it much easier for the Canadians to advance to take the, the DQ line. The challenge was the British artillery, which the Canadians used, had about a 30% range disadvantage versus German guns. So German guns had in a larger, longer effective range. So the limit was about 2,500 yards or meters. Um, I use yards and meters interchangeably here. Uh, that the Canadians were equipped with uh, a new uh, recuperator gun that could push the range out to 3,500, but they had not changed over entirely. So the effective range was about 2,500 yards. And that was the big challenge is what do you do? How do you extend it? Now, given the way the Germans defended, what the Canadians should have done is wait the six hours and fire the field artillery barrage again. And they would have undoubtedly been able to overrun the first division and have been very successful at much lower costs. Uh, in my analysis of second harass, what I found is that when the Canadians fired a barrage with sufficient density, such as, uh, you know, less than, uh, you know, well, it's, if they had a sufficient density, they were always successful. Uh, they were sometimes successful when they had a less dense barrage, 
but it was usually pretty unique circumstances. So even when they attacked the strongest German defenses with the best German units, the barrage was, could be very, very successful. So, but the, you're, you're handicapped. It means that your advance is limited to 2,500 yards. I think what's interesting is that in the next battle at uh, Canal du Nord, the Canadians, in fact, did a whole set of barrages where they leapfrog artillery brigades, fired another barrage, and then did another leapfrog. They'd learned the lesson that they can't count on the Germans not defending in depth, and the barrage was your friend. Right, yeah, thank you. Thanks, David, for your question there. Let's, uh, let's have another question. Brendan Hogan is somebody who, who have not been able to get on the Zoom call, but Brendan's question is this. Um, was there any thought of attaching engineers or pioneers to the CIF to help with their mobility issues? That's Brendan Hogan's question. No, and that's one of the surprising issues of what wasn't done. Uh, there were engineers assigned to artillery batteries to move up to be able to support the attack at eight o'clock. Because one of the challenges with all the trench lines and so forth, it was really difficult for the artillery to navigate through this. So they had assigned that, but they did not do so. The thinking was, is that, um, you know, the attack was going to be so brutal that the, um, you know, the Germans wouldn't have time to uh, be able to do any road blockages, etc. before the, the Canadians were on top of them. It turns out that, according to German records, there was actually a bit of a gap in the line, but it was closed long before the CIF showed up. So they needed to attack more like around 7, 7.30 as opposed to 8 o'clock. Okay, th thanks uh, for that. I was waiting for the response from the uh, person asking the question, and I just realized it was me. So... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, so um, Patrick, you've been waiting patiently there. Uh, you've got a number of questions. Uh, feel free to ask um, any or all of them um, because um, we, we do have plenty of time here tonight. Well, it's a two part question. Uh, and uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Stewart, for an amazing talk. This was really interesting. Uh, second of all, uh, uh, or, uh, I was wondering. How large a part does the assault of the DQ line uh, play in the official Canadian narrative of the war? I mean, it's uh, how should we, the Canadian forces did, how should we put it, cover themselves with glory. So there, there are a lot of things to choose from. Um, well, it, it's, uh, at least in Canadian historiography, it's almost an afterthought in okay. that as important as the assignment is, all the attention, if there is any, is on Amiens. Yeah. Because that's the big battle. That's the precursor of the Second World War. It's tanks. It's the Black Day of the German army, etc. And so the focus is on Vimy. And then, you know, bad things happen on the Somme. Bad things happen on Passchendaele. But the Canadians still triumph. And then you get Amiens and its glory. And afterwards, the Germans are beaten and there's not much left. The reality is the second harass was a really vicious dogfight. The Canadians suffered well over 11,000 casualties. So the Germans didn't roll over. There were some, uh, there were some German units like the 91st Reserve Infantry Regiment, which consisted of basically two companies uh, filled with men that were looking for a route to the rear as quick as they could. But then you also get units like the 2nd Grenadier Regiment, which is at full strength and they are ready to fight to the end. So you get this really um, very um, wide range of capacity within the German army at, at, at Ras. But as historiography, it's just kind of an afterthought. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, the other question was, uh, uh, it uh, pertained to what you said about how they managed to not get saddled with uh, uh, Douglas Haig's cavalry. Uh, I was wondering, how were, well, were there any real frictions between the Canadian command, uh, Army Command and the British Army Command, uh, or was it generally harmonious? 
it was generally harmonious. The British, I think, did a really good job at all levels from the government down, uh, recognizing the Canadians were an important part. I mean, beyond the four divisions the Canadians fielded, which were half as large as a British division, uh, four of the top 10 RAF aces were Canadian. Um, up to maybe 20% of the pilots were Canadian in the RAF. Canada provided 40% of the field artillery shells that were fired on the Western Front in 19. So for a whole range of reasons, Canada was important. So it was important to keep on side. Where there were frictions was with individuals often on the flanks. Like, so during second arrest, the flank corps was the 17th under a guy named Charles Ferguson and Haig, uh, pardon me, uh, Curry and Ferguson did not get along. Curry thought he was a complete blow art and not a particularly bright character a view I think most people uh, agree with. Uh, so there was a certain amount of friction where Curry's trying to persuade Ferguson to actually help him make an attack as to your benefit type of thing. Um, the relationship officially with Horn was good. I mean, Horn uh, did what he needed to do for the most part. Um, I'm sure he got tired of Curry walking over him to get to Hague to make, get things changed. But generally speaking, there is not the kind of large scale tensions that uh, you might expect to see. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate this topic. I'm uh, right now, I, I work as a teacher, but I'm also co authoring a textbook on the First World War for the high, uh, high school level, which goes into a bit more detail than the general textbooks. Mm -hmm. And uh, often, unfortunately, Canada. Uh, the, how should we say the imperial uh, addition to uh, to the armed forces on the Western Front are sadly overlooked, at least over here. I'm in Sweden, so it's quite. Well, a if it's away. any consolation, it tends to get overlooked in Canada as well. So not much different. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick, for that. Um, and just in a very timely manner, indeed. John Azar has rejoined us. So, John, oh. welcome back. I think you had uh, some internet problems there. Yeah, I went, I went blank. It was as if Microsoft was doing an internet and the computer just rebooted. Anyway, oh, so, sure. uh, Bill, the question, like, I started saying, like, fact checking was so difficult for the First World War at this time period uh, because of all the, you mentioned most of the people are dead. But um, in response to one of the other, commentators before, there's a lot of staff officers work on these books. And um, do you have any idea who might have written the, was the primary author of the section? That, uh, uh, Bruce, about Bruce today? history? Yeah, I well, and so, and then the other question is, what was the state of the academic history, military history at this time of the writing of the book? And how, how much are they generally consulted? The community. Well, so I'll ask the academic part. There was very little in the way of academic military history uh, in, in Canada. The military is very much a second thought. There's hardly anything like Stacy was probably one of the first to specialize in military uh, on military topics. Um, so as a result, it's, you know, it's left, certainly in the German uh, army, it's left to staff office to write the official histories because they're expected to have the necessary uh, intellectual capacity to be able to uh, to write it. Uh, as to who worked on the Brutnell, I don't have it at the top of my uh, top of my mind right now. Uh, Basil, uh, like there was a brigade major, I think was one of the characters that was involved. It was usually like GSO two, GS three type uh, characters that were assigned to this uh, mission. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of interesting sort of side comments of trying to get. Uh, colonels to uh, explain that you know what actually happened. You've got your account, but uh, you know what actually happened. And there was a really interesting uh, side note to this: is that on the 30th of August, uh, the First Canadian Brigade made a very clever attack that unhinged part of the German line. Then the Germans counterattacked and caught them from the flank as well and rolled them back. And so the commander of that brigade was a guy named Griesbach. And 10 years afterwards, he writes writing to the division commander, uh, Batty Mac MacDabell, and says, you know what, I kind of fudged the account. I didn't mention the troops broke and had to be 
forcibly put back into line because I didn't want to bother you with all of these details. And so that's the kind of history of what actually happened that we just don't get if you don't have someone writing when people are still around to be able to tell you these stories and that you can then get various perspectives to see, well, how likely was that to really happen? I think the best comment was one of these staff officers said is, and talking to these colonels, what you get out of them is all they can be assured of is that they're far ahead of everybody and they're getting shot at from every direction, including from behind. That's right. Are we doing a better so job I, now? Sorry? Are we doing a better job now of military history? Oh, yes. I mean, there's, I mean, we're writing up far more recently I think there's a far better sense of how important it is. Um, I mean, one of the, the things that Aitken did is that he set up a group to gather information and they would go around regularly to units to tell the, uh, usually the adjutant who wrote the, the war diary, you know what, after the war, the people that write the history are going to rely on this, put some effort into it. And there were units like there was the 18th and 19th battalions in the 4th Brigade of the 2nd Division that are night and day different. So the 19th uh, uh, war diary is just filled with information. You can write a really rich story. And the 18th is we attack today. And that's sort of what it's, you know, at the level of, of commentary. So you really can't say a lot about what's going on with the 18th battalion because they didn't provide any information. But I think today you're right. I think we're doing a much better job. We have uh, people that are dedicated to gathering the information that uh, are far better educated and capable of writing on these topics. Yeah, well, thank you again. Great job. Thanks, John, for your question there. Um, right, so we've nearly run out of questions. So we've just got, so if anybody wants to fire in a question, please do so uh, on, on the Zoom. Um, Edwin Astill, um, uh, there is one question here from Edwin that's just come in. Um, I think Edwin doesn't have any uh, uh, microphone or, or, or video, so I'm going to ask you for Edwin, and, and it's this. To what extent were these official histories used in post-war training of Canadian officers? Uh, well, since there really wasn't much in the way of official history, it was almost nothing was, it, it just simply was not used. Um, the, I mean, the, the notion of the official history is that it is as much a perp the purpose is teaching uh, officers to understand military history and understand what has happened to give them a vocabulary that when they go for more advanced training, you don't have to give them all the details. They already know it and you can talk about more of about the nuance of what's going on. Well, since there really wasn't much that was produced, um, the you know, the Canadian, uh, there wasn't much to uh, be able to use for that kind of education purpose. And I think one of the comments or one of the things that I've, I've noticed is that uh, the Canadian military in the Second World War had pretty much forgotten everything it learned in the first. Uh, if it wasn't something exactly related to the shooting part, they kind of forgot whole sorts of stuff. So for instance, by 1917, every Canadian soldier traveling from England who had been trained had a, uh, in their past book, all of the specific training that they had uh, passed and who was the individual that was responsible or signed off on them so that they could, they found some soldier uh, did not know how to fire their, their rifle. They could trace it back to who was that person back in England. We didn't introduce that into the Canadian army until 1944. And it was this great revelation. We need to do this. Like they had completely forgotten that there was an, uh, a training system already in place. And that was because there was really very little institutional uh, memory of what was going on. Okay, thanks. We've got a, a question in from uh, Facebook. Um, so I'll just uh, ask this on behalf of Mark Carmichael. Uh, and Mark asks on Facebook, are there any great war memoirs written by Canadian veterans documenting their experiences in these series of battles? Uh, there's usually, um, you know, there's like uh, Clement's book on the 25th Battalion. There's Donald Darwin's book on the 26th, uh, but they, you know it's it's just one of a whole series of events. There's nothing that is specifically about 
um, you know, the experiences at, at Aras. And the thing about the 100 days is that we kind of, I think, thanks to the dominance of Amiens, consider them all of a part, when in fact, uh, the Arras battle and Amiens battle were very different. Uh, Canal du Nord was a very different battle, again, somewhat mishandled in its approach. Uh, the Canadian Corps by Canal du Nord is a very different beast from that that started at Amiens. All of the training and all of the troops that it, it had carefully prepared are burned up by uh, Canal du Nord between Amiens and Arras. Like when uh, one battalion had gone through eight, you know, by the end of Arras, one battalion had gone through eight company commanders. It had lost its entire scout it pretty much lost the entire battalion command staff, most of its senior NCOs. So it is, uh, you know, gone through quite a harrowing set of experiences. Now, each battle that they fight, they don't suffer as much as they did on the Somme, but it's the combination. Like at Arras, the Canadians were fighting at a, a rate 13 times more than on the Somme. So that's just the, the, the intensity of the fighting has just ramped up. Units are getting burned out. So you get a very different experience between Amiens, Arras, and Eldenor and the later stages. Okay, thanks for that. We've got a very, very specific question from Barry Johnson. So forgive me if, if this is slightly off, off piste or, or, or too specific, but Barry asks, in the second official history of 1938, there is a map of the Ypres gas attack uh, of 22nd of September 15. Is the map reliable in terms of gas coverage? You can just answer, you don't know if you want. Yeah, I think it's it's it's, it's pretty accurate. I mean, the the um, Nicholson's history is based on Duguid's history. And while I don't in, uh, agree with a lot of Duguid's interpretations, he gets his facts right. He has... Uh, you know, he's gathered every bit of information that's available. So, uh, yes, the map's the map's pretty good. Thanks for that. I'll probably have this as the final question for, for tonight because it's now quarter past nine uh, our time. Uh, Richard Crow um, asks a question, and it's probably a fair question, bearing in mind that uh, we've we've had a fairly fairly quick gallop through through high level strategy. So, so Richard's asking one. Uh, more about uh, tactics. So uh, Richard says, excuse my ignorance, but what is indirect machine gun fire? So perhaps you'd care to just uh, explain that one? Um, to sure. Uh, okay. So indirect machine gun fire is a little bit like, like think of it as equivalent to indirect artillery fire. So the machine gunner does not see the target he is firing in effect blindly. So he's firing at a uh, steep angle and so that you can strike areas where you can't get at like the reverse slope of a hill. And so you're firing in a zone. You're not firing an individual target, you're firing in a zone. So you can use up a tremendous amount of ammunition in doing so. Um, and it was part of the move that the, the machine gun arm was trying to position itself as a an arm that's fit between the artillery and the infantry, but was separate from both of them. And so one of the ways that they were able to try and position themselves as this new arm is this idea of indirect fire. And it's used uh, primarily as harassment. So say for instance, you want to stop the Germans from uh, repairing uh, damage done by an artillery barrage or bombardment at night, you can't see it. So you fire uh, in the general area of where these things are and it will limit the kind of uh, work that the Germans can do. So hence the, the indirect machine gun fire. Super, Th thanks for that question, Bill. It was gonna be the last question, but Campbell's uh, come up with a, a pretty pretty good last one and which will definitely be the last question. So Campbell, over to you. Thanks for taking the question, David. Uh, Bill, another tremendous presentation. Thank you so much on Thank a you. bleak January day uh, here in Ontario. Um, question about the official history part one. I wonder if, if uh, General Curry's involvement was also prompted uh, as part of the this ongoing feud he had with Sam Hughes. And you know, Aiken was a, a supporter of Sam Hughes, I believe. And I'm wondering if, if Curry was was kind of, you know. Well, I think it's it's all part of a, a of 
his specific uh, concern is Aiken is going to write another history and it's going to it, it, it it's going to undermine him. But it's right. part of Aiken is also part of a larger group, including Sam Hughes and other uh, figures in the government and in high status positions that are gunning for his uh, his position as the commander of the Canadian Corps. And he's, I mean, his Corps has suffered an enormous number of casualties. And while he thinks it's an absolutely necessary thing to have heard, Canadians have suffered 45,000 casualties. Well, someone's going to get blamed for it. And so it's a really easy target for it to be pinned on Curry. So if Curry can write the history, he can cut and avoid all of that kind of uh, unpleasantness by telling the story the way he wanted it to be yeah. told. Yeah, for sure. Great. Thank you. Thanks for your sure. question there. Thank Thanks. You. Bill, I, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, this evening. It's been a, a very enlightening presentation that you've given us. Uh, and in the, uh, uh, I just invite everybody uh, once again to do a final round of applause silently using the um, raise hand button. Uh, so thanks very much for that. And there are lots and lots and lots of hands going up as a silent round of applause. So ladies and gentlemen, that's it for this week. And um, we're back again next Monday. But before we uh, rejoin next Monday for a webinar on Thursday, just in a few days time, we've got a virtual tour uh, coming up. So WFA members can join the virtual tour of the um, Battle of the Somme, the 51st Highland Division's attack at Beaumont Hamill. So that is available to WFA members via the uh, members area of the website. Please do join us at 7.30 p.m. UK time for a virtual tour of the Battlefield of the Somme on Thursday. Bill, thanks very much indeed again for your work tonight. Well, thanks for the opportunity to speak and uh, thanks to everyone who asked questions. It was an interesting uh, set of questions. It was. It was a, a, another excellent uh, Q&A session. So that's uh, that's uh, what we look forward to, as well as uh, listening to, um, to, to your talk. So thanks very much indeed, Bill. And on behalf of all WFA members, thanks very much for your work. And uh, I'll, on that note, I'll say good night to everybody. Good night. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah.